Okay, that's where we left off. Um, so this is muscle lecture two. So we're going to talk about uh, some structures here. Uh, epimysium, paramysium, endomysium. These are connected tissue structures. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle cells. And then we'll go into this. Uh, it makes more sense when you can see it. Okay. So here's the entire muscle. So see what they're doing. They're blowing up the muscle here so you can see it, making it larger. Um, so the entire muscle is surrounded by epimysium. So that's epimysium around the entire muscle. This is a fascicle. That's one, that's one, that's one. Those are fascicles. They're pretty big. You can see them with your eyes. You ever cut open a steak at the restaurant or at home, and then uh, you can see um, fascicles inside of there. They're, you know, they're large. You can see them with your eyes. Um, so around a fascicle would be some connective tissue that's called perimysium. So see, there's your perimysium. So here, this whole thing's your fascicle, and they're looking at it in cross-section here. There's your perimysium. Around a cell or a fiber, remember, same thing, skeletal muscle fiber, skeletal muscle cell, same thing. Um, there would be endomysium. So this, that would be your sarcolemma, that little pink line right there. And outside of that would be the endomysium. So you can't have connective tissue inside the cell. It's outside of the cell, right? So the way I tell what I'm looking at, I wish they would have done these in a little bit different colors. Um, if I see nuclei, see like that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one. I know that I'm looking at a cell. That's a cell. That's a cell. That's a cell. So um, a that's a bundle of cells. So that would be a fascicle. So there's my paramysium around the fascicle. Now look down here. I go, oh, there's a nucleus. There's a nucleus. Um, where up here, there's a nucleus. There's a nucleus, nucleus, nucleus. Um, so um, down here, I know this entire thing is a cell. So if that's a cell, that would be a sarcolemma. That would be an endomysium. Over here, I can't see any nuclei. I'm too zoomed out. So I know I'm looking at a large structure. And so I'm looking at the entire muscle, right? And so around the entire muscle would be epimysium. Okay? So just slow down and look for the clues, right? If there's no words on here. And you go, okay, that's the entire muscle surrounded by epimysium. There's a fascicle, pretty big thing. It's surrounded by perimysium. Here is a fiber or a cell, pretty tiny. Uh, so that's surrounded by endomysium. So like I said, if you get lost, look for the nuclei. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one you know. Um, and... Then, you know, that's a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell. So this is a collection of cells. And so that would be a fascicle surrounded by paramysium. Okay, so that's, a lot of this just point and name. Um, this is just a closer view. You got a Z line here, a Z line here, M line. There's myosin, there's actin, T tubule, terminal cisterna, terminal cisterna, right? Um, okay. Um, Technically, that would be a Z disc because see the way this thing is shaped like a cylinder. But when you're looking at it under a scope, it looks like a line. It's M line. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, don't forget terminal cisterna, uh, T tubule, terminal cisterna, all of three of those together. That's a triad. What's the function of the T-tubule? Carry the signal. What's the function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Store and release calcium. That's one of the functions. Okay. Now, take your white out and get rid of that line. I don't like the way this is drawn. Okay. We're not pointing at endomysium here. They're trying to point at the whole structure and saying it's surrounded by endomysium. So this would be the endomysium. Okay. There's your nucleus. So you know, you know you're looking at a cell. So if that's a cell, that's sarcolemma, and that's endomysium. Hopefully that makes sense. Same thing here. Get rid of that line. Okay. Um, it's saying this whole structure, this fascicle, is surrounded by paramysium. Okay. So this would be a fiber, 
it's a fiber fiber in other words cells because look nucleus 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 so you got a conglomeration of cells <laughs> surrounded by connective tissue so this is a fascicle surrounded by paramecium get rid of this line same thing get rid of that um this is the entire muscle so these are fascicles right so the entire muscle would be surrounded by paramecium oh uh, sorry 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 <laughs> epimycium <laughs> scratch that <laughs> so the entire muscle would be surrounded by uh epimycium see how easy it is to do it happens happens to me too um so just slow down and just go okay i'm looking at the whole muscle get rid of that line if this is the entire muscle say that's the entire one of the heads of the biceps um this would be epimycium okay so all right let's look at some uh larger structures here so there's the Achilles tendon, by the way. They're trying to call it calcaneal tendon, but most everybody still calls it the Achilles tendon. And if you don't know where that name comes from, you know, it has to do with the Greek god Achilles and, uh, you know, his vulnerable area. I'll let you look up the Greek mythology there. I don't want to ruin it if you read the story. <laughs> um, so tendons attached. Um, skeletal muscle to bone or skin or another muscle but mainly muscle to bone an aponeurosis is a wide flat tendon of sheep so this is an aponeurosis here in this name of this epicranial aponeurosis above the cranium there's an aponeurosis right um how are muscle fibers or perhaps you should say fascicles organized um and it's six different ways actually i think they kind of added a seventh um so parallel convergent circular so here's parallel see the way all the fascicles are running in the same direction so there's they're calling this biceps brachii okay this is one they recently changed the designation and they're calling it a fusiform in your in your lab book it may say fusiform check in your lecture book um if you still call it parallel i'm going to give it to you but since these two heads you know the bicelets has two heads i guess since they're fused together they're calling it a fusiform um it's cool if you call it parallel if i show you that okay um here's a convergent so let's see see the way the fascicles are converging onto this tendon so this would be pectoralis major you know right there in your chest um that's a great example and then here's circular right You're going in a circle basically and so orbicularis oris remember around your lips that's a great um great example of that uh unipennant bipennant multipennant okay we don't know these muscles yet, so don't worry about the, the uh, you know, which ones were given as examples. But the unipennant, they're going on to one side of a tendon. Pennant, I think it means flag. You know, like when you have a pennant race at the horses, you know, it's flag race. Um, so they're on one side, okay? And extensor digitorum, which you don't know that muscle yet, but should be able to figure out what it does sort of by the name extends the digits okay by pennant you can see the fascicles are going in uh different directions <laughs> right two different directions and a good example of this is a rectus femoris you know that's in your quadriceps um what's cool about this you pack in a lot of fascicles rather than if you're they're all going the same direction um it's not going to give you as long of a contraction because of the you know the geometry of it but you're going to get a very strong muscle here because you've got all of these fascicles packed in right you can pack more in um and then here's a multi pennant deltoid you know up in the upper arm where they where they give you a shot uh or like a flu shot or whatever um 
that's a good example of a multi pennant. It's really almost like it's separate muscles that are fused together. So that's a uh, one tendon, that's a tendon, that's a tendon. So the deltoid is a multi pennant. Whereas in a cat, you know, uh, basically their deltoids in three different parts. You know, they all have like clavo deltoid or chromial deltoid, whatever. Um, but in us, it's just a deltoid. Okay. Origins, insertions, and actions. Make sure you get these uh, uh, things correctly defined here. Um, the origin is where a muscle originates, so it's more stable. It's the most stable region of what it, you know, whatever it's connected to is very fairly stable. Uh, the insertion is going to be more movable, right? And the action is just what happens when the muscle contracts. So origins and insertions are the point, the points on the skeleton where the tendons attach to the skeleton. The origins tend to be proximal on a limb to the insertion. Uh, and the uh, insertions, uh, sorry, and the actions tend to pull the insertion closer to the origin. Uh, so let's look at that. So. Here's the biceps brachii. Two head, remember? This is more stable than this, right? They both can move, right? But this is more stable and it's more proximal. Hence, these are the origins. So, this is called the short head of the biceps brachii, and this is called the long head of the biceps brachii. It's not that long, it's maybe an inch longer than this guy. So, what are, what, are, what are we connected to up here? The coracoid process of the scapula on the, the short head is connected to that. The long head is connected to the supraglenoid tubercle. Remember, I kept pointing that out, but I didn't put it on your last test, so you know it'll probably show up on this test, right? Um, so these guys, this muscle, then inserts on the radial tuberosity. So the insertion is more distal and more movable, right? So <clears throat> what's the action? If you just contract this muscle, it's going to get shorter. So what's going to happen? You're going to flex at the elbow. You're going to flex at the shoulder, okay? Or you could say flexes the forearm, flexes the upper arm. But I just go by the joint. Flexes at the elbow, flexes at the shoulder. Um, so... Um, hopefully that makes sense. The most stable part, that's your origin. The more movable part, that's your insertion. What happens when that muscle contracts, that's the action. So the action would be, whoop, flexes there. And that's going, that can go up to flexes there. Okay, don't worry about third class fever. I'm not going to ask you that. Uh, make sure you know the general, uh, basically uh, the general definition of hypertrophy. So hypertrophy, it's getting bigger, you know, so the muscle is getting bigger. And so each muscle cell gets larger because you're getting in, increased concentrations of mitochondria and glycolytic enzymes. So in other words, the cells, as far as I know, for the most part, aren't really dividing and making more cells. They're just getting more stuff inside each individual cell. Now that's up for debate. There's still a lot of uh, there's still a lot of debate on that. <laughs> uh, so they think under certain conditions, some folks do, that um, a muscle cell can split down its length. A skeletal muscle cell, maybe half the nuclei go with one, half the nuclei go with the other, and then it becomes two separate cells. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that can happen or not. Um, and guys like this, sometimes they let them do a muscle punch biopsy and then they'll, uh, work out and then they'll do another one and they can somehow determine, did the cells divide or did they just get bigger? <laughs> you know, so I don't know the, I don't know the particulars of that, but whatever, <laughs> for the most part, they think they do not divide. It'd be cool if they do um because then maybe you could um repair damaged muscle okay don't stress on this too much this is a laboratory setup where if you just take a muscle and you tether it at either end 
uh, then you can pull that muscle. Okay, so if you physically pull a muscle from the what would have been the origin, what would have been the insertion, you can stretch it, right? And you can pull your sarcomeres apart. So look at here, this poor, this poor sarcomere, like that's a Z line, that's a Z line, barely any overlap. So this poor little myosin head right here and right here, these little myosin heads, that's the only ones that can do any work. They're the only ones that can grab and try to pull. So you're not going to generate much force. So that's why this y-axis is force, right, or tension. Um, you're not getting much here. Now say you relax that uh, tension on the muscle a little bit, and you allow a better range of overlap to occur, then, yeah, you got more myosin heads that can help you. And so you can generate more force, so you can see, oh, your total tension uh, is going up. Now here you're in a great zone of overlap. So now when these myosin heads do their thing, uh, you can generate a lot of force. Okay, here you're almost overlapped too much. So you can see what happens when you're pretty much done. You know, the Z lines are in as far as they can go just about. And, you know, your myosin just can't do anymore because you're, it's, it's the, uh, gone as far as you can go. So what happens, the, um, uh, the force drops off precipitously. See, not making much. Now, like I said, this is skeletal muscle. This is in a laboratory situation. So this doesn't really happen with it connected to your bones because, you know, the origins and insertions are, are fixed. I, I mean, you know, the length of the muscle is fixed pretty much as far as being able to stretch it. Now, where can it come into play and store this in the back of your head for when you get to physiology? It's the heart. Is heart muscle or cardiac muscle striated? Yes. Hmm. So think about it. If you really feel your heart up with blood, can you stretch those sarcomeres out? Yes. So here's the cool thing. When your heart's just, you know, sitting there pumping, you're not really doing much exercise, um, you're almost overlapped too much. So they don't make good, strong contractions. Whereas if you go run up and down the stairs, you feel that heart up with blood and then it it stretches these sarcomeres out and you get into a better zone of overlap. So now when you need it, you're making better contractions and pumping more blood. So like I said, store that in the back of your brain for uh, physiology. It's kind of a cool system. All right, not going to ask you about the sources of ATP and muscle like creatine phosphate and glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. Don't worry about that. Um, so this is just for you guys, FYI. It's for you physiology students, okay? Now, I have asked a couple of questions off of this. Uh, what contributes to muscle fatigue? Um, so basically, you're getting a decrease in available ATP. So how can that happen? Well, if you don't have enough oxygen, that can happen. Or if you run out of glucose or glycogen, you know, that, that can happen. So what's the result of this? You're going to slow your sodium potassium pumps. We, we've talked about those a little bit. You can build up lactic acid, right? Uh, even say you contract a muscle many, 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 many times. Say your fingers, say you're wiggling them back and, forth, back and forth. At the neuromuscular junctions, you can actually run out of acetylcholine if you do that long enough. And so if you run out of acetylcholine, then they call that junctional fatigue. And a similar kind of thing can happen in your central nervous system, too. And they call that central fatigue. Um, so I could just ask a question. Name a couple of things that contribute to muscle fatigue. Don't give me an answer like running a long, long way, working out at the gym for hours. No, no. <laughs> I'm asking for something a little more scientific than that. Okay. So these would these would result in a depletion of O2, depletion of glucose or glycogen, that kind of thing. Um, not going to ask you about slow twitch and fast twitch. That's for you physiology students, FYI. But it's just kind of cool. Uh, I'll leave that up there for you guys. Don't, don't worry about it for anatomy, though. Now, motions, and we'll get into these more 
later, but it should be a whole list of them in your lab book. And it actually, they may be under the skeletal lecture. Um, so anyway, make sure you go over them. The things like dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, stand, plantar flexion, standing on your toes, dorsiflexion, rocking back on your heels, extension, flexion, you know, abduction, adduction. There's plenty more. There's circumduction. There's rotation. There's protraction, retraction on your thumb. It's opposition, reposition. You know, it's a bunch of them. So make sure you go through all of them. I'm not going to ask you the definition of them very rarely. Um, but these are the terms you use when you're uh, describing the action of a muscle. Okay. So like this lower leg, that's extension of the lower leg, right? Uh, what does that? And it could be these quadricep muscles up here, right? Um, so anyway, uh, go over the, that terminology because you use it in describing the actions, okay? Supination, like you're going to hold your hands like uh, to hold a bowl of soup. In pronation, you're turning them over. Technically, they're rotations, yeah. Circumduction, if you drew a circle on the chalkboard with your shoulder base, you know, hold your arm out straight and then use your shoulder to draw a circle uh, with the piece of chalk that's in your hand. That would be circumduction. Uh, there's protraction and retraction. So poking your chin out would be protraction. Bringing it back would be retraction. You can do that with your shoulder blades too. Also, with your shoulder blades, you can do elevation, depression. Can you do that with your mandible? Can you elevate your mandible, depress your mandible? Yeah. Inversion, eversion, we talked about on the last test. Okay, and then this, there's our beautiful picture. You can really see the H zone, the A band, the I band, nucleus. Here you're zoomed out a little more, but you can still see the striations, but this allows you to see, oh, look at all the nuclei. Oh, that's got to be skeletal muscle. Oh, by the way, see this junk in here? That's connective tissue. Probably these cells were together, and they kind of got torn apart in your, um, in your slide a little bit and this is well if that's a cell that's a fiber around that would be a sarcolemma but you can't really see it right there and then around that would be endomycium so that's some endomycium probably torn away from it when they made the slide they're normally a little closer together like this who knows right um and then we're done i told you it wouldn't take long all right, I'll put this one up on YouTube for you too. Okay.